we're excited to have him here to present honor to him and also to welcome and uh, celebrate his birthday. So first I'd like to call out a few people, um, definitely the host who is um, with us, Moneta. She's hosting our um, this birthday here at 1300, which is a beautiful place. Um, also Vicki, she was our events coordinator, thank you so much. And definitely Jackie, <laughs> she did so much for um, helping every, getting everybody together here to uh, celebrate. Now, some of you may be wondering why did we choose 1300? Well, one, it's beautiful. Uh, the food is amazing. But also, Grandpa, as you know, is a photojournalist, and his uh, photographs have been an integral piece to capturing the diverse, warm, and welcoming time of San Francisco, Fillmore District, back when it was more diverse than maybe if you walk down the street today. <laughs> um, and one of his most famous uh, photographs, looking south on Fillmore, which all of you have on your table, is the um, favor. There's a larger rendition of this in the lounge here at 1300. And so, you know, we thank Moneta for giving Grandpa that honor to be able to still have his name here in the history of San Francisco, Silver District. Also, right around the corner, just about a block away, his name is etched in concrete. David Johnson, photographer and photojournalist. And again, it's just um, goes back to the fact that San Francisco has changed, or San Francisco Fillmore has changed a bit, but look around you today. There's so much diversity here, such a warm, welcoming uh, community here that we're able to be here on, in behalf of David Johnson. So uh, we're happy that you're here. Thank you so much. He's my granddad, so I've seen a different side of him. <laughs> uh, he knew me when, you know, obviously I wasn't born, and so he used to, from Florida, send me jeans and say, okay, I think this is your size, let me go ahead and send this to you. And so I always knew him as, that's just my granddad. And then once I heard that he was a historian, a photojournalist, that was a shock to me. <laughs> so all of you knew him in a different way than I did. And so I'm just glad to be able to be here to honor him as my granddad. Thank you so much for everything that you did for me. Um, and I can't wait to see you at 9500. <laughs> so we'll go ahead and get the program started. We have first on the program, um, Supervisor Bree, she's here. Thank you so much for coming. She wants to say a few words in honor of um, Grandpa David. So we welcome you now. Thank you. Uh, my name is London Bree, and I'm so honored to represent this amazing district on the Board of Supervisors. I was born and raised here. I grew up right down the street, two blocks from here. And this man has been an amazing supporter of the work that I've done over the years. Before I was on the Board of Supervisors, I was the Executive Director of the African American Art and Culture Complex. Mr. Johnson came walking into my office uh, and talked to me about the history, showed me his beautiful work, and I didn't realize, because I had seen his pictures all over before, I didn't realize he was the actual person who took those photographs. <laughs> and he definitely gave me a history lesson, he educated me about the history of the city, and his work is just so amazing. It just tells an amazing story. Back, way back then, not many people had cameras. When I was growing up, we didn't have cameras. You know, I grew up poor, and we, didn't, we weren't taking a lot of pictures. And so when I look at my photo albums from my family from back in the day, I remember the stories, but I don't have the documentation of the stories. And so that's what makes Mr. Johnson's uh, work so much more critical today than any other time because he has documented our history, our culture, our city in a way that you don't see uh, nowadays, in a way that makes it clear that yes, there used to be a very diverse African American population all over this community. Yes, you know, these buildings weren't here. There were houses and homes. And unfortunately, yes, redevelopment did destroy this community. And his documentation through his lens has really 
made sure that that history is not forgotten, that we remember what happened, and we work towards trying not to make the same mistakes that we did in the past that really changed and destroyed our community. And Mr. Johnson, you know, you have always supported me stopping by the African American Art and Culture Complex, saying hello, encouraging me. And when I was there, we did one of the largest exhibits of his work. We basically put out a great exhibit that told the story of when he took the photos, who were in the photos, who he didn't even know were in the photos. The one of your brother, um, the one that you gave me, Frank, that I still have. Just amazing history. And what I appreciate about the exhibit that we did at the African American Art and Culture Complex, the kids, they loved it. They asked questions. They saw young African American boys in suits and thought, wow, this is amazing. It was a great conversation. It was a great history lesson. Mr. Al Williams, who's from the African American Historical and Cultural Society, and Dr. Hoskins are two amazing folks who helped us put it together. So much history, so much culture because of one person who made it possible. And so I couldn't let the day go by without making sure that I stopped by to honor you, to, to show you love and to show you support 90 years, <laughs> 90 years. <laughs> 90 years of friends, family, documentation, and one of the most loving, caring, humble men that I know. Mr. Johnson, on behalf of the San Francisco Board of Supervisors, I do this a lot, but it's so personal today because I consider Mr. Johnson a friend, and I do appreciate you know, the fact that you have been so supportive of me and just such an amazing inspiration and historian in this community. And we truly appreciate your work on behalf of the city and county of San Francisco. You are a true legend and will always be remembered in this city. Thank you so much and congratulations and happy birthday. <laughs> But do you want to say something? <laughs> well, wait, he's talking to you first. I'm overwhelmed, and I'm so excited and appreciative that you took the time out from your busy life to come in honor that. Can we go back and wave that you indicated? We had lots of conversations about the community and the shows we put together, and you were extremely supportive. I appreciate it. Thanks for being here. that 
economic development and that thriving that was on the street, it was really my personal goal that my restaurant would come back and the street would come back and be the same way again. So thank you for that inspiration. So thank you and happy birthday. Thank you. Okay, so we'll go ahead and follow the next um, presenter who is going to come up and say a few words. Mr. Jeff Gunderson, who um, is the library historian at the San Francisco Art Institute and also knows a bit more history about how uh, David, I'm going to call him Grandpa, okay? <laughs> so strange to call him David. How Grandpa um, became, um, or how he developed his craft in photography uh, by working alongside and um, gaining that guidance from Ansel Adams. So Jeff, if you can come up this time, that would be great. Thank you. All right, Jeff. Oh, David. Happy birthday, David. <laughs> um, it is really terrific to be in the Fillmore. This sense of place is something that's key in the history of the city, in photography in the city, and in, of course, the biography of David Johnson. In a lot of ways, it's he is very reflective of it, reflective of the history of the 20th century. I mean, David, as most of you probably know, was born in poverty in segregated Florida. And then as he says, he dropped down the rabbit hole when he fell into San Francisco and moved in with Ansel Adams to begin in the photography program at what was then called the California School of Fine Arts, which is now the San Francisco Art Institute. And it was a long story, it's from World War II, from the segregated Navy that David was in, and coming through the Golden Gate and seeing San Francisco and thinking, this is something, this is a place, here's an ad for a photography program, maybe I'll go do this. And I don't think he knew it was the very first fine arts photography program in the world. I don't think he realized he was gonna be the first, in the first uh, group of students here. But he certainly was, and he studied with people like Ansel Adams, Edward Weston, for all of you many wonderful photographers who are here know all these names, but Edward Weston, Dorothea Lang, and Eugene Cunningham, Lizette Modell, uh, Meyer White, all these people. But what really made that program better than anything was the fact that these students, some of whom are here right now, including John Upton, and Charles Wong, these students who study photography in San Francisco at that time were like teaching graduate students. They had experience, world experience. David was the, not only the only African American in that first class, but he was the youngest in that class, I believe. But he'd already been to world, into World War II, and he brings back all those experiences, not much less the um, experience of growing up in, in segregated Florida. And so he brings that to that mix of people. It was like teaching graduate students, Meyer White said. It was like teaching people who, it was on a one-to-one -one level. These were students who really pushed the boundary. Benjamin Chin was one of those people whose family is here today, who was from San Francisco. But David becomes part of that Fillmore as he moves from Ansel's house to the Fillmore and photographs in the Fillmore. He wasn't the only student who photographed in the Fillmore. Jazz was a crucial ingredient in the photography of all those people. You know, Ansel always wanted to make sure people were paying attention to music. He had this relationship between music and photography. Ansel was interested in classical music. The students were all interested in jazz in post-World War II, and they hung out down there. This is where they were. This is where they photographed. You get pictures by David of um, Langston Hughes, and you think, oh my God, you know. You get pictures of, um, by David of all those luminaries that come through the Fillmore and go to um, black churches in San Francisco that he's a part of. You get, you get photographs of David's of, um, that are considered documentary photography, maybe even photojournalism. But what it really is, and what Ansel stressed, it was fine art photography. It truly was art. You know, David, as much as he's a photographer, is an artist. He could have captured that decisive moment that Henry, Car Henry Cartier Prasad would talk about, that picture of the Fillmore that you see, or the people in the jazz club that are dancing. That was, what, that was what David lived in, in that milieu and continued to photograph in that. Um, it's, it's hard to know where to stop talking about David because <laughs> he's somebody who 
is still photographing, at least I hope he is, because he has a vision that he needs to continue to share with all of us. And I wanted to go shoot his ancestral roots off the east coast of um, the United States too, because that's a, that's another little piece of this puzzle. So you know he's a, he's an artist. He was born this way as an artist, and luckily enough, he found his, his way to San Francisco to the film work to do the kinds of things that he does now. And we expect 90 more years out of that vision. <laughs> so, thank you, David, for sharing that vision. Outstanding, that outstanding. Was, uh, that was um, a wonderful way to walk down uh, memory lane. Wonderful way to hear a little bit more about uh, the history nice that job. Garfield brings to San Francisco, to the work of photography. Um, so next we'd like to hear a few words from uh, Jack Von Yu, and he is the um, curator uh, of Pick. Uh, pictorial collections over at the Braincroft Library, which is a part of the UC Berkman campus. And they recently acquired um, Grandpa's work at their library. So, we'd like to hear a Thank you. Um, I can't tell you what a privilege and what an honor it is to be here. Um, someone, I think it was Lou, uh, who remarked that if you look around this room, this is what the Fillmore was. All people of different heritages here together talking and honoring um, Ansel Adams' first African-American student of photography. That, that's it's just really amazing. Um, I don't know if, if many of you know about the Bancroft Library. It is the special collections library for um, UC Berkeley. And we, our library is very much involved in documenting and preserving the history of the West, particularly California, and also Mexico. Um, our library came to um, UC Berkeley um, in 19, Oh, six, uh, just after the earthquake, um, the uh, UC moves in very slowly, and <laughs> they had actually acquired H.H. Uh, Bancroft's library um, in 1905, and suddenly there was an earthquake, and they thought, well, maybe we should do something and get this stuff over here, um, which they did. Um, Bancroft's library was the only library of any import to survive after the 1906 earthquake. And it was outside of the fire ring. In, um, there is a plaque uh, in the mission near Mission Dolores, which you can see um, where the um, original Bancroft library was situated. So, I am probably one of the people here who has the um, newest relationship with, with David. Um, I saw David's work at Stefan Kirkaby's gallery, uh, Smith Anderson North. I know Stefan is here somewhere. I saw him, he's hard to miss. Um, <laughs> and he, sh he uh, he had this big show, and there was David um, seated, surrounded by his fans. Uh, you could hardly get to him. And I, I was just so um, intrigued. And uh, this was about, I don't know, five years ago. And um, in the last couple of years, we got in touch, and we talked about how to preserve this archive, that, this amazing archive. Um, the Bancroft Library has actually been collecting African-American history in the West for many years. It, practically from its inception, from the gold miners, from the African-Americans who, who worked um, in the gold fields, and there were. Um, you don't hear about it very often. We have diaries. 
we have an amazing collection of literature. Um, so in that way, our, our collection, David is not the first. However, I will say this, um, we have approximately four, we actually have eight million photographs in the, in, or eight million pictorial items in the Bancroft Library. And we have a number of wonderful collections that deal with African American history. Um, we have great images that were um, collected by other people. Um, however, what and I, I have to say this: David is the first photographer, the first African American photographer whose archive is in the Bancroft. It is um, truly an amazing thing. Um, what is interesting about that to me, and I know to historians and, and other people, is the fact that we have lots of photographs, but they were all taken by people who were somewhat removed from the community that they were actually documenting and photographing. With David, he's actually a major part of that community, and that shows in his work, and which is one of the reasons why the Bancroft is so thrilled and excited to have his work come, come to us. Um, it's I think it is, in my view, and I've been curator since 1998, um, I think this is one of the most important archives that I've had the privilege of um, bringing to the Bancroft. I, and it's been an honor to, to meet David. Um, my colleague who's here, Christine Holt-Lewis, um, has also kept up emails and correspondence and phone calls with, with David and, and uh, Jackie Sue. So on Monday, the two of us and, and another colleague are going to David's um, apartment and Jackie's apartment to pack up and bring his archive uh, to the Bancroft. So, one of the things we, we do in the Bancroft is we're very interested in preserving what we call original material, unique material. So, David's work will be preserved, um, as far as I can tell, forever um, in the Bancroft. Um, Unlike a museum where some, some curator has an idea, puts up a show, and it stays up for maybe four or five months, it comes down, and all the work goes back into the drawers until the next curator comes along with a bright idea. Our work, our collections are actually used by thousands of students, people from all over the world, come to the Bancroft to study Mexico, to study the American West, um, to look at Mark Twain's papers, which are at the Bancroft. Um, we have uh, archives and correspondence with, with um, well-known African-American poets such as Ted Hughes, um, these are, these, our, our collections are not mothballed. They are actually used. Um, we have the busiest reading room of any special collections library in the country because we are open to the public. You do not have to pay. You do not have to be affiliated with the university. You, you do not have to be a, a scholar of renown. 
um, you can literally come to the Bancroft, show a picture ID, and gain access to the reading room. So anybody who at some point wants to come and visit David's work, they are free to do so. It might take us a little while to get it all preserved and housed the way we think it should be, but um, it will be it will definitely be used. It will be a treasure for people from generations hence. And um, I, can, I cannot tell you how absolutely fantastic this is to have this archive. Um, this is the best part of my job, is to meet people like David, who actually is very unique. I've been sitting at the table with, um, with Dave, some of David, David's family, and I want to know what what's the juice you guys drink. <laughs> it, um, I want some of it. Um, when I met David uh, at the Bancroft Library, Dorothy uh, White was there. She came and drove David um, to the Bancroft, and we had we we had a meeting. And we discussed some of his work, and. When David said, "Well, I'm, you know, I'm going to be 89, and, and now he's 90," and I, I thought to myself, "No, this can't be true." I mean, he, he was so alive. He still is. He's so active. I want to be like that when I get to David's age. Um, well done. David Johnson family, they have something. Um, they should bottle it and sell it. Anyway, I, I'm, I'm absolutely thrilled to be here. Um, I'm so grateful to David because he has been incredibly generous. Um, we are a public institution. David had other choices, but I think he really wanted his work to stay in the Bay Area and to be in a, uh, what is, one of the premier universities in the world. So um, thank you, David, and thank you for having us all here. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was wonderful to hear more about uh, why and how Grandpa's um, photos became archived at the Bancroft Library. So thank you. Now I'd love to invite Lewis Watts, and he is co-writer and publisher of Problem of the West, and uh, it's another work of art where Grandpa had the honor to place his photos there, be documented, and walk through history of San Francisco Gilmore. So, thank you so much. Uh, so did you get the, the significance that his work's gonna be in the Bancroft? It really means that forever that his work will be accessible to the world, so that is not insignificant. I, I'm really happy to be here, I was saying, this is kind of a version of probably the way the Fillmore was 40 or 50 years ago. This was the center of cultural life in San Francisco. Um, I'm one of the co-authors with Elizabeth Pepin. Stand up, Elizabeth. There she is. Column of the West, um, a, a book that sort of has kind of taken me by the short hairs for at least 20 or 30 years. I actually came to San Francisco in 1964, and someone brought me to the black section of San Francisco. I just figured it was like Roxbury or, or uh, the Central District in Seattle or Harlem, and it was. And um, it was a Friday night, and it was jumping. It was like amazing. And I, could have, I didn't realize this, the historical significance. I just thought it was like other places. And uh, I actually moved to San Francisco, or the Bay Area, and three or four years later, when I came, I, I knew this is where I wanted to live. So um, uh, I sort of realized that this area that someone had taken to me to had a series of uh, empty lots. This was probably would have been in the, the 70s and maybe later after some redevelopment. In fact, where we were sitting was an empty lot for like 30 years. There were parts of the film where they were like a war zone. So I won't go through the whole history of it. Some of many of you know it, and you sh if not, you should purchase our book that's about to be republished. <laughs> and um, we hope the time in February um, called Harlem of the West. 
um, that this was a kind of miniature Harlem of the West because there was already the infrastructure, there were a lot of clubs and institutions. And sort of coincidentally to World War II starting and the Japanese being interned, this was the place in San Francisco where people from primarily Texas and Louisiana settled that they stayed in San Francisco. So there was an amazing, people said they would come here a Friday night and go from place to place and, uh, and then finish it on Sunday night. That there was sort of nonstop action. We did, um, so um, I found a cache of photo, I can't tell you this whole story, but I found a, a cache of photographs in Red Powell's, I, I want to say two people's names, Red Powell and Reggie Pettis, people who saved that archive. But he had photographs in his shoeshine parlor, and both Elizabeth and I on separate occasions went there and he summarily threw us out. And when I went, he, um, about two weeks later, had a stroke. And when I went back, because my friend Mildred Howard said, mention my brother Billy and he'll let you in. Because Billy had grown up with Red. And he was gone and the walls were bare. And someone out on Fillmore said, I think someone rescued these photographs. But you know they did not know anything about it. So maybe four or five years later, I got hired by the redevelopment agency, uh, who was attempting to make a jazz preservation district. And in the course of um, interviewing people and trying to find visual information, I was in the New Chicago Barbershop and Reggie Pettis said, oh, they're in my back room. But Reggie had rescued the photographs. These are photographs of all the, the personalities that come through San Francisco as well as local people. And uh, many of you know that in the black community, the, uh, sh the shoeshine parlors, the barbershops, yeah. the beauty parlors, and the mortuaries are the archives. So he was doing what people were doing all over the country. He had this incredible collection, and it turns out part of his collection came from Wesley Johnson, who had the Texas Playhouse. So there was this thing where uh, Reggie threw me out of the shop, but at this point that I found the photographs, I, I said, I better not mess this up, because Reggie's looking over my shoulder. He literally died two weeks after I um, uh, met with him. So this has kind of been me at learning Photoshop, trying to restore the photographs. Um, we uh, find a meeting Elizabeth, who had worked for Bill Graham and had a list of all the clubs that had been in the neighborhood. We sort of met and said, we need to do a book. And we were both so busy. But, and then um, she was the co-producer of the uh, documentary that KQED did, did on the film work. If you haven't seen that, it's really amazing. And through that effort, we were able to find other photographers. And, and I think she, someone had told her about this photographer, David Johnson. And then someone else, three or four people said, you need to meet David Johnson. And so David shows up, and he's got these photographs. And I said, what? where is this? This was a, a person who really was an artist, someone who's had photographs of a wider range of the community. A lot of people in this community, or a lot of people made their living going to the clubs. You would take pictures of people or the entertainers, go home, develop the film, um, and then come back with the prints before 4 or 5 in the morning. So David did that a little bit. I don't know if he stayed up that late. <laughs> but he um, had photographs in the Tremelon Ballroom and a number of other places. But he also had photographs on the street that sort of documented the life, the, what, the, the sort of life people were making here. So we knew we had a contribution of images that really expanded this dialogue. And immediately we were like um, really close. I consider him a very good friend. He's still my mentor. I keep claiming I'm his mentor, but you know, that's not true. <laughs> and um, I have to say, um, I, see, I saw him maybe a month ago. He looks better today than he did even a month ago. So I don't know what, what he's taking, but there's a number of people in this room that want to find that out. <laughs> One other thing I want to say, I want, so the, the, the book that we did is about this history. It's about kind of a visual history as well as um, oral histories. But it's also about the photographers that really did document for a variety of reasons. One of the photographers was uh, Ricardo Alvarado. And I just wanted to acknowledge his daughter um, who is here because that sort of story of people teaching themselves and actually documenting the case. He, thought he worked in the kitchen in the Presidio. And you know he was with some brothers and sisters and, and photographing this neighborhood, but also photographed both the Filipino and the Hispanic communities. And that story and kind of people doing that has been one of the most amazing things of sort of me being um, involved in this collection. And as I said, I actually learned digital, I learned how to finally do digital photography, um, trying to restore these photographs because I, had, I was of a generation where I was very comfortable in the darkroom, but changes were coming. 
And I had, I had taken classes, but I wasn't interested in it until it was something that I was invested in. So it changed my own career. Um, and we have, since the, the, the second edition of the book, we'll have a wider variety of information. Some people that wouldn't talk to us because people were very suspicious in this community for good reason, because of what had happened with the development. But um, Layla King, who lived just down Eddy, uh, gave us her archive, and we've gotten archives from Nanny Duncan and a number of other people. So the new edition, which will be out, and maybe we'll have it launched in this space, um, we hope, hopefully you all will hear about that, and I'm sure David will have to use his community. So, uh, happy birthday, David. I, I, you know that I, I want to grow up and be you one night. <laughs>